Hello. Can you hear us all right? Yes. Oh, Thank you. That works. Great. <laughs> uh, my name's Leah Raymond, and this uh, is... Joe McClintock. Nice to meet you guys. How did you get here today, Joe? I came by train. Of course you did. More of which later on. <laughs> um, we wanted to call this session Demand Jen is Dead, mainly to wind people up at Madfest, to be honest. Um, but there's a serious story behind it, and I, I hope you'll um, get into it with us today. And if there's a little bit of time at the end for questions, then great. If not, come and chat to us, and we'll be here just afterwards. Um, I work for a company called Eden Lab, uh, a newish business, and I'll tell you a little bit about what we do, and then, and then Joe's going to talk to you about um, some amazing work that's happening at, at Trainline as well. Why is demand gen dead? Because it comes from a world of marketing which is, I don't care what it is I'm selling, I'm just selling it. And we've all probably, in some part of our careers, worked like that. The truth is that if you're working in marketing and doing a brilliant job, but what you're doing is driving up the extraction of resources out of the planet and making things worse, then really we're, we're making things much, much worse. And all that reducing friction and increasing conversion is actually a, a bit of a disaster, really, isn't it? Stuff that you already know about, and this isn't a presentation necessarily about that today. This is a presentation about what on earth people like us do about it, people who know about marketing. Um, my view is very simple. Our view is simple, which is if, if marketing can shape behavior and aspiration, then it can reshape it too. So what if we were to do that? And that's what demand switching is. It's, it's death to demand gen with no thoughts and no consciousness. It's a new way of doing marketing. So I'll define it for you more clearly, which is demand gen is, or demand switching is switching out of high carbon, i.e. high carbon products or unsustainable products and brands and behaviors, frankly, into cleaner, greener products, brands, uh, and services. And that's entirely what we're doing all the time. So great fun to work with Trainline in that context. And that's 100% the mission that, that Eden Lab is on. I thought I'd give you some good news, really. I don't know how much you see this or feel this or sense this, but the post-carbon world, the world that will exist when net zero, eventually we arrive there, it's already being born everywhere all around us. It's just that not everyone can see it yet because it's kind of living at the same time as the old world that's slowly dying. But I'll just give you one example. Like last winter in the UK, last winter in the UK for the first time, renewable energy was used to power homes more than fossil burn, like gas burning power stations for the first time. Briefly, not for the entire year, not forever, but for that moment in time, we were getting our energy from clean sources. We should be excited about that and feel positive about that. And there are so many places where there are good things happening. And the narrative of like, it's all screwed, give up. I, I don't buy it, we don't buy it. And, I, and even if it was true, I'd rather go down fighting than give up. So that's where we come from. Here's some examples there. You know, I've copied the lines off the charts to make it a bit simpler. But you know, in so many spaces, we're seeing the new economy being born. I'll give you a stat. I think I've only got one stat. You've got some more. <laughs> yeah, um, last year, the net zero economy in the UK was growing at 9%. And the normal economy at the same time was 0.1%. That doesn't take a genius who works in marketing to figure out that being part of the new world might be a good idea for you and your business. And that's what we're about. You know, McKinsey talk about how big that scale of that thing is. It's like there's an industrial revolution happening. I don't know if you know this. I feel like this stuff is happening. People aren't really thinking about it. It's like an amazing steam train has been invented or a train's been invented and everyone's still combing wool thinking, I wonder what's going on. You know what I mean? That kind of disconnect between these two economies at the same time. So it's huge, and it's now. It's also, this is the chart that just shows you the blue ones are, these are all tech firms in America and how well they're doing on stock exchange. The blue line just shows you how the ones that are focused on climate tech are doing. And it went down a bit during some of the downturn towards the end of that 21-22 uh, period. But the point is they're growing faster because it's a good long-term bet, isn't it? I will challenge you and say, if you're not already here, that sustainability is like the new digital. And it might not even be called this in the same way that new, no one talks about new media anymore, right? But sustainability, if you go around a room 10 years ago and said, hands up if you know what HTML is, the people that didn't put their hands up, they were in trouble 10 years later career-wise. So if you don't know what scope one, scope two, and scope three are, which is like really nerdy, techie sustainability chat, you need to find out. And we'll talk about that later but it's exactly the same principle. How am I doing on time? I'm rushing through it, but hopefully, yeah. is that pace all right? Yeah? We think that 
the majority of the conversations in sustainability industry as a whole, if you can call it like an industry or a, a discipline or a function, is really, really, really focused on this side, supply side. And rightly, it's important. Worrying about what light bulbs are in up here, worrying about how we got here today, worrying about the energy that's powering the building and the food and the waste and all those things, they're all crucial. The challenge is, is that unless you can kind of link this to demand at the same time, as in you're creating a pull-through effect, this stuff starts to stall. Is anyone here, hands up if you work in a sustainability role in a client organization. Power to you, because it's a freaking hard job, isn't it? And one of the reasons for that, from my point of view, is that making that connection between what has to be done and how the business can exist in the future, so commercializing sustainability, is the next wave of what's required. And that means context, understanding behaviors, thinking about platforms and content and propositions. And Joe's going to show you some brilliant examples of that in a moment. Um, so the next wave of sustainability is on the demand side and the supply side, but not just one. We've got a model that we use. In fact, it's part of a workshop that we run with our clients, um, which we call demand switching. You've seen the, the word earlier. But it's how might you go about organizing to do demand switching. And there's lots of different ways of doing it, but we found like six really clear ones. Joe's going to talk to you a little bit in a minute about substituting. So how you can swap out one high carbon behavior or unsustainable behavior for one that isn't. I'll also talk to you about an example of shrinking, so how you can reduce the amount of stuff. Have any of you used those laundry sheets? Seen those laundry sheets, the flat sheets? They're less impactful than a giant box of uh, insert Unilever or P&G brand here. Or you can save, so keeping things going rather than letting them fall apart which is part of the old mentality that we grew up with and our parents had, but this generation has lost and needs to refine. Or just sticking with things that keep around for longer. Sharing them. Like, I have to admit that I am, I'm a reluctant DIYer, and I once had a drill, electric drill. I haven't got it out of the cupboard for about 10 years. It's crazy. Why do I own that thing? We should be sharing it, and someone should be building a model they already have to share those items in our lives. And then finally... What about not buying anything at all? Can I find a way to give my customer or my, cons my consumer a benefit but that's done through an experience or learning or some other kind of connection, not just through actually buying something? So some quick examples, and then we're on to trains in more detail. This is one of my favorites, and it's, it's kind of the model of what good marketing and good business thinking will look like next. Have you heard of a company called Deep Green? Anyone? So what Deep Green do is they put data centers next to swimming pools in the UK. And the data centers provide free heat to the pool. So the local council can heat the water. It's about 80,000 pounds a year for nothing, which encourages local people to be able to go live healthy lives and swim. Lovely social impact. But by the way, half the operating cost of a data center is cooling it. So then the water from the pool cools it, thus making it economically brilliant. There's no waste going on, and it's social impact. It's the perfect, just the dream solution. If you want a techie slide, it's there, but I'm not here to talk about that in detail. To do with oil, basically. Anyway, the point is, those are the kind of ideas that we need now. And why can't you in your sector, your industry, your business be part of doing that? That's my question to you. Another little one, and then we're on to Joe. Uh, I think Octopus Energy are doing amazing work in this space. Like, they're one of the leading firms. They're doing some talks this afternoon in London later on as well. And what I think is brilliant is they always think about how can they help their customers share in the, in the financial benefits of more renewable and more sustainable behaviors. Have you seen saving sessions? Is anyone using it as a customer? few, right? So I think what's so smart about it is what they're trying to do, just for those of you who don't know about it, is they're trying to keep energy consumption under a certain threshold so it stays being renewable and you don't have to turn the gas-fired power station on. Do you get me? So on a cold day, people want more energy and there's a risk you'll go over on renewable. So what they say to their customers is, is, is if you don't mind, if you, we know we're going to hit this spike around 5 p.m., why don't you um, go out to the pub instead? Here's a voucher from us. Or why don't you uh, do something different? Or why, would you like to t help us by just turning off some of the devices in the house? And then we have an opportunity to stay within that threshold. And by the way, you get points for it or rewards. And it's a game. And it's social. And it's predictive. And it's based on the Internet of Things to the sensors in your house. It's, that's, what, that's what modern combination of digital strategy and marketing and sustainability looks like. There are so few examples around. We're about to see some in the way from Joe. But... This is the opportunity of a lifetime to be part of making that happen. So I think I'll stop talking about some of those examples, and maybe you might talk about this one. Cool. Thank you. Um, so this is in the bucket of substitute. It doesn't mean the slide needs to be substituted. Just, <laughs> just when I looked at that earlier, I was like, oh. Um, okay, so uh, 
Nat in my team is here at the front, um, and she, to be fair, needs to take most of the credit for this, so, and, and, and I'm talking about it. Um, so she's taking an eye roll at me there, but anyway. Um, <laughs> so for me, this is extremely close to my heart. Um, I really believe in making a difference. Um, from uh, many, many years of probably therapy, I've been very much learned that actually things that really motivate me are, are, are things that perhaps are a little bit unjust in the world and need to be changed and, and I really believe there are things that can be changed when it comes to sustainability. So um, Trainline started this about 18 months ago, it feels like a lot longer, um, but we're going to talk to you a little bit about why we did this and, and, and what it's done so far and, and the path forward, but um, yeah, it's been really fun, so thanks Leo. So uh, Energy's kind of started to get its act together, I have to be honest, and um, it's really showing up transport, which I'm going to talk about in a moment, some stats, but you know, you've just spoken about two amazing, you know, innovations there from Octopus Energy and around the heating, around the swimming pool that absolutely blows my mind that someone's done that. It's incredible. Um, and actually now, transport has become the worst uh, culprit when it comes to carbon emissions in the UK. And it's, it's really sad to see. And I think this is one of the motivating factors for, for us and the work that we've done. But also the other motiv motivating factor is we have a platform that's massive. You know, we are like the, the number one rail brand in the UK. We've, we've got huge uh, customer base, huge awareness and high frequency use case that it means that we have the opportunity to use that to, to, for good, basically. So um, it, it's hard to see here, but this kind of hashed out box at the top rep represents a 30% gap in the government's plan to reduce carbon emissions from transport. So there is no plan for that 30% gap. So we're kind of going, well, hey, look, we, we could fill that with some stuff. We could help. We could you know, really try and do as much as possible to close that gap. And that's why we, we, we came up with our Came By Train, which I'll explain how that kind of operates in a moment. The other amazing stat, again, which blew my mind, was that you know, when you think about everyday things we do in our lives, like recycling our stuff, putting it in the right bin, the food bin, the paper bin, etc. We, as a society, rank that, you know, as probably like one of the top two, three things we could do to help with climate change. It's actually the 60th thing you can do. And actually, just living without a car for one journey or two journeys or three journeys is the best thing you can do. And obviously, I want to be realistic here. You know, I'm not suggesting that people live without a car in their lives. You know, I live in the countryside in Norfolk, and I use both a car and the train, and I use planes also, but I try and really cut that back. So, you know, it, it's about making things realistic for people and, and not out of reach. So, how do you get people to think about trains or, or you know, low energy uh, transport when you've got this challenge or you've got a huge education job and awareness job to do? So, what have we been doing about it? Well, um, one of the most amazing things we have is an, a massive amount of data. So we know basically every rail route in the whole of the world, <laughs> uh, but particularly in Europe, uh, where they go, how long they take, how many people are traveling, what's the CO2 emissions, how much does it cost to travel, by which time of day, night, all those sorts of things. Um, so Nat and the team did a huge piece of work uh, back at the ranch, it basically created this database we call um, uh, Super Routes. And these routes around the UK and Europe, and there's about 7,000 in the UK, um, are as cheap or cheaper than going by car, um, as fast or faster than going by car. So there are many, many options for us out there to take a train over a car, okay? And we have developed this database that we want to democratize as much as possible to allow other rail brands or other transport providers that want to get people to make better choices. And when it comes to I came by train, that data helps fuel what we should do and, and giving people options. But actually, one of the biggest things we all have is, I don't know if you may or may not have heard of it, but it's the attitude to action gap. So basically, when we say we're going to do something, but we don't quite do it. And the main reasons for that in, in travel, and I, I work with Travelist, which is, um, when, it, when it founded, it, it's basically a brand that's a, a coalition of different uh, organizations that's helping to drive uh, modal shift. Um, it was founded by the Duke of Sussex. It, it really is about trying to get as much reach as possible to understand or, or get information in front of people to close that attitude to action gap. But what we found, the biggest challenge we had, was that most approaches were very negative, and they were basically what we call 
flight shaming or car shaming or making people feel bad about their decisions when actually we know in everyday life you can't just switch everything, right? The other thing we, we really felt was this, we needed to create this sense of pride that actually if you'd made a switch, you yourself were like, wow, I've nailed this. I've really made a real difference. And it's just one journey that I've done has made a huge impact on the climate. So that's how we came up with I Came By Train, working with our creative partners, Mother and Wavemaker, um, our media agency. The idea of I Came By Train is that if you were to arrive at a destination and someone said to you, how did you get here? And you said, I came by train. It wasn't just talking about the transport method in which you arrived at your destination, but that person knew about the choice that you made and that it was a better choice for the planet not just for your, your, the convenience of your, your, your travel and your destination. So the whole idea of I came by train is that when I arrive at a destination, I can say that, I can say it with pride, and I can feel really good about the choice I made. So what have we been doing? So it's 18 months old. Like I said, it feels a lot older. <laughs> um, but we, we started the campaign 18 months ago. We, um, we worked with an artist, Craig David. Um, he's a well-known artist. I'm sure you know him uh, for many, many generations uh, who love and adore him. He wrote a song for us called Better Days, I Came By Train. I must admit, I was really panicking about writing a song about trains. Um, <laughs> I'm pretty sure that when the team were going to show it to me, I was going to get fired. But actually, <laughs> unfortunately, it was absolutely beautiful. It, it's what he called or penned a, a love letter to Mother Nature, and it's, it's actually incredible. We also worked with um, some amazing uh, creative folks on, on, on animated video for that music. Um, track and then also we worked with um, many different media owners to create billboards and murals and lots of really great content around the UK to really promote this idea. So this is year one, um, we learned loads, we've got great recognition within the industry as well because the government has such an impact on what we do um, and, and we were like okay so what now, what do we do next? So we did it again. So then we went to Manchester last year and we said right let's just try a little area and see what happens. Can we get this area to change behaviour? If we invest X amount of money, what can we do? And we saw some amazing uplift and, and recall from the campaign and actually what uh, consumers did in terms of changing behavior. And so then we're like, okay, what's next? So last week, we were in Glastonbury. <laughs> so we're just back. I think the team came back yesterday after helping people get off the site. Um, these are some pictures from the earlier campaign, but this is me um, uh, arriving by train. Uh, to the site and uh, what we did is create the team created a hero's welcome so this is a solar panel um, powered billboard uh, people are coming in and out of the site we're getting snapped like a kiss cam style and uh, we were we were creating content which the team are going to be putting out this week we we're speaking to music artists etc about traveling by train and Glastonbury is an amazing partner and they really are trying to look at how can they reduce their carbon emissions and get more people on onto train travel okay so um, just to, to wrap things up before I hand back to Leo, um, we really believe that every single one of us can be climate heroes, genuinely. Like, if, you can, if I could just ask this room to consider or actually act on taking the train over a car journey once this year, you're going to make a huge difference and a huge impact on the planet. So our job next is really to grow the reach of this thing. We're working with other brands, we're working with investors, and really looking at how can we grow uh, this movement into something much bigger than it is today. Hand it back to you. Thank you. So Joe's example is a you know, brilliant, brilliant version of demand switching, right? So taking you out of a car and putting you into a train and making it actually a much better experience all around. And we think that any company any client, any organization can get involved in demand switching if they see their way through that. Sometimes the company will have an amazing low carbon solution already like trains, right? In which case it's about being the absolute best marketer you can be and making it clear that it's either switch or die because it is switch or die ultimately, I'm afraid. But what if, what if you don't actually have a really sustainable product or service? What do you do then? Well, my point is not necessarily starting at communications as a solution that's part of it obviously but maybe it's about thinking more intelligently about well or more creatively perhaps about how might we switch demand in a powerful way what could be the benefit we could offer that would actually make it worthwhile how could we give some more value in exchange with a customer that meant that they would be prepared to choose and make this choice and it's definitely possible in every category we've worked in so many categories it's doable but you have to believe it's possible rather than just saying i'm stuck 
I can just do what I'm told to do. I'm the unwilling victim of a demand gen mindset. Can, can Leo, can I just add to that? I think one of the other things is sometimes when it is hard, you can actually create things out of nothing. Sounds a bit bonkers, but like with, with this, obviously we were quite lucky that trains are more sustainable, but there might be some things in your organization that are naturally more sustainable. And it was kind of, we sat there and we went, we've got a thing, but we just kind of need to create something out of it. So I think I always think about making sure you have the right team around you that can help you lift, lift out of the kind of the day to day and just think about an idea that's just perhaps really simple and it could start really small and, and then just grow and grow from there. Yeah, I don't think we necessarily always say you have to bore the ocean in one hit. I think pilot projects, small impacts are the way to make, a, to make positive data and get confidence to go forward. If you were starting yourselves, there's three things that you might consider doing either on your own with our help, um, with our help or, or with the help of people that you work with. But one is we do a, we do a demand switching workshop. Just use that model to think about how might you apply that to your business. I think it's really important to make sure that you're linking it to, through to the commercial story. Too much of like do good and marketing, which has a role to play, I think, hasn't got any connection to commercial impact. And without, I believe that unless we make money green, i.e. unless we use things that companies understand, revenue and profit, as a way of driving change, they won't do it, and then we've had it. So that's why I think forecasting future demand, which is not, it's art and science, but it's definitely doable, and we should do that as part of what we do as a day job, I think. And just, finally, sorry, benchmarking. Sorry, just on, on yeah. this one here, like, a live example for us is that we, think, we don't think about like, demand for train line, we think about the category. So it, there's a little bit also about how do you think about your responsibility as a brand or a business for the category you're in, not just as yourselves. So there's another way to, to look at that to kind of extract yourself if you kind of get stuck in any sort of commercial you know, day-to-day -day or drudge, as it were. Yeah, and finally, looking at what your competitors are doing. So people look a lot at like, scoring companies on their reporting and sustainability. They're not scoring themselves on how well they're changing demand. So what is it? Unless you're changing demand and you're in business, I don't think you're really doing it properly. So that's the final slide. Um, you're welcome to get in touch with us. Come and speak to us. We want to work with lots of people and do cool stuff. And uh, thank you for attending this talk. I'm really glad you made it. Thank you, Jay.